Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We will call this meeting to order. Before I start, I would like to uh, indicate or express to you that the flags in front of the Douglas County Courthouse have been lowered to half staff to honor the victims of the two mass shootings of the weekend in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. The flags will be lowered until sunset on August 8, 2019 as a mark of respect for the victims of the tragic acts of violence. May we bow our heads, please, for a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, we'll call this meeting to order. Uh, clerk, public comment. I believe we have three citizens who have signed up for public comment this morning. Um, we value our citizens' uh, input. Uh, the Board of Commissioners definitely want to hear you and respect your First Amendment right. But also we ask that your delivery be in a seamless and civil manner this morning. And uh, I will start with Ms. Ingrid Landis Davis. Would you please come forward, give us your address, and your subject matter is coordinate this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ingrid Landis Davis, P.O. Box 875, Winston, Georgia. Uh, I came to speak this morning about the rush to judgment with the coroner. Joining me up here is uh, Cindy Fedak, first vice, uh, second vice chair of the Democratic Party of Douglas County, and Dr. Bidwan, National Action Network. The rush to judgment that was exhibited this past week by the appointed DA's, DA in his office <coughs> really disturbed us. They requested a, a criminal contempt of court um, filing against her. She was not even, that was even before the facts were in. I appreciate that they stepped back from that, <coughs> National Action Network. Um, but um, the information that was put out was very um, biased and very um, incorrect. Let me just put it that way. Um, the media uh, put it out like she did something wrong, but she did not. Um, what bothers me also is that every commission meeting, citizen Larry Pierce comes up and makes all kinds of innuendos and accusations against her that are unfounded. And now the judicial system seems to be taking it up and clearly is unfounded. So um, it's a witch hunt and it's time for it to stop. Um, there's also a grand jury investigation request that came out July 19th, and that needs to be dropped because based on the wording of the, the, that, that investigation, it's, it's the same uh, bogus uh, nonsense. Uh, it's poisonous. It's dangerous for us as a community. It's dangerous for our community. And the coroner is being harassed. And it is said, as it said, as the victims of Parkland shooting said, we call BS. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, usually, what, what you have to do, you have to sign in. Uh, well, I, I didn't see the sign in the roster. He wasn't aware. Of the That's right. We'll come back. We'll come back. And so oh, okay. But there is a statement that I'd like to make as it applies to this weekend's shooting and the ongoing atmosphere here in Douglas that would be yes. um, you, you usually, I, I usually require you to sign the or <coughs> if you approach her when you got in. Well, you certainly can have, you can have a seat, sir, if you'd like to do so, and I can see what I can do before you and just if I'm already happy. Just let me acknowledge the folks are already on the list, but I just, I'll give you two minutes. Uh, Mr. Larry Pierce, please come forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Three days ago, well, that was three days ago, and I didn't take it off. And the reason I didn't take it off is because I learned from a good friend, Bill Posey, a long time ago, check the record the day before you go to court. And I came up here Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning, and there was this file, as they just stated, there was a slight error made. But at least we forget what the April 29th order was. There was no error made at that time. So in reading it, it's kind of difficult in reading it to understand. It takes me about five or six times to read in between the words. I'm not going to read anything. But it does boil down to that Mr. Leonard capitulated. Then they stipulated. Stipulated is a legal term. It means the parties agree. Well, my term for me is I meditated over it, okay? Now, I'm here to let you know <coughs> that I'm out of here. I'm not coming back up. It's over. Why did I decide that? And decided before I knew they were coming up. I decided it because on March 15th, I made a statement to the judge, and I said that if I find out that the coroner has a disability, either mentally, physically, or otherwise, I'm going to step out. Well, she does have a handicapped parking ticket thing. Don't know what it's for. And if I didn't know what it's for, I'm not going to tell you, because y'all can find out on your own. So, with that said, I'd like to tell you, and madam, after two and a half years, I would like to take just a tiny bit longer to tell you about a friend named Bill Posey. Very few people in life get talked about when they're gone. <clears throat> Bill Posey was an attorney mm -hmm. in town, and he lost his daughter in the third grade. Here he is here because he loved uh, Mark Twain. And that's Hal Hemrick, Hem Hemrick, the movie star, at a party in Leville, who lived in my house. <coughs> he had no place to go. And I found him living in an apartment in Atlanta. And I said, Bill, come up to Douglasville because people still care about you. And he did. But all I'm trying to say now is one last parting words, and that is Bill had a client who had shot somebody at the motel out here. And back then, the way they did it is they had ping pong balls. And when your ball was drawn, you were the public defender. Two minutes. No, and as a public Mr. defender, Mr. Peters, no, we're not going with two minutes. As a public defender, can you wrap it up? Keep as going. a public defender, he asked this black man mm -hmm. who was 80 years old. He said, "You identified my client?" "Yes, sir. Yes, I did." He said, "I noticed. You said you were 80 years old and you were sitting on the porch with glasses on." He said, "Now, sir, will you tell me how far can you see to identify my client?" And that. Old 80-year-old man leaned forward. He said, well, sir, I see the moon every night. Well, I see the moon every night, and the light has come, and the light is off. Okay. So you all do what you want to do. Thank you. Live how you want to live, because you got to live with yourself. Thank you. I'm out of here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. I appreciate your contribution to county government. Appreciate you. Next we have, last but not, well, we have Mr. <coughs> um, Professor Tomaski, if you could just come forward. Goodbye and don't talk about me. Then again, do talk about me. It's not funny. 
Uh, good morning, good morning, all, especially the gentlemen visiting from the NAN. Madam Chairman, I would first like to ask if I will get as much time as the previous speaker. Yes, you will. Thank you. But, however, still I want you to stay focused and your subject matter is independence, right? Is that your subject matter? Yes, ma'am. I always oh, okay. stay on subject. Okay. I, and I don't abuse Tuesday by sneaking in open mic conversations. I got you. I'm listening. Thank Professor, you. Professor, keep going. Tomorrow will be the 57th anniversary of the independence of the uh, native land, not of myself, but of at least one person in this room. But Mocha men say nothing so. And to this day, there remain four maroon communities, one in Portland Parish, one in St. Mary, where I was on the Colonel's <coughs> Council, and one in St. Elizabeth, which is the seat of the Maroon government. A government recognized by a number of countries, including G7 countries, whose ambassadors visit to pay their respects to the Colonel every January 6th. In the history of that country, there is, for example, Tacky's Rebellion. Tacky was, cap was a captive laborer on an estate, and he fomented an insurrection, which ultimately took control of most of the island and was not quelled until relief forces came from England to put it down. Taggy was a captive laborer. He was a slave to those who presumed to own him, but he was not in his own mind, a slave. <clears throat> Slavery is when one accepts his situation. It even devolves into some slaves being so-called house Negroes who will report on the field workers. I mention this because it's relevant to this country, including this county. My youngest son came home from school one day, and this was during February, we know what month that is. And he asked me, were any of my ancestors ever slaves? And I answered him, along the lines you just heard. And I would think that people should start to realize that February includes certain elements which do not question but subtly reinforce the status quo. And this is something that I would be happy to discuss with anyone afterward. If February is going to achieve what it was intended to achieve, it needs to actually become a month that is based on history. What actually happened, how and why and not the Black Mystery Month, why is some of this status quo misrepresentation included? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tomaski. Okay. 
provided. I provided an extra minute, so I just want to let you know I did <coughs> four minutes. That's why you have quite a while to elaborate, okay? Thank you. Make sure you understood that. Okay, um, Dr. Benoit, if you could come up just two minutes because you really didn't sign up and kind of, I'm, I'm veering off course on my practice here, but I'm just going to give you two minutes and I ask that your presentation be civil. You see that resolution has been reach regarding maybe one of your concerns. So if you could just uh, just give us two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, good morning, Douglasville Board Commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Reverend Jeffrey Benoit, President of the Clayton Henry Chapter of the National Action Network. I'm here this morning to address the board as to the ongoing situation with your corner. I'm going to deviate that and coalesce it with this weekend's events, the mass shootings. There's not one of us in here that does not survive off of the blood in our veins, the air in our lungs, and the water that nourishes those. So with those three like elements that sustains us all, what makes us different? What makes us different? What makes us different is the hate that we have developed. You weren't born with it, you had to develop it. And I simply say to this board and to this community, is this a community of hate? I think not, I think not. If in fact there is a mistake, do you crucify your child or do you try to correct it? As it applies to the board and to this corner, if in fact there is a mistake made that should be corrected. Do we go to the extent of crucifixion and imprisonment and belittling and badgerment and defamation of character as opposed to trying to correct it? When we had the affordable health care, yes, it was a new program that needed some work, but it was attacked. I went to jail for that attack, standing up for health care. Now, I'm not the only one in the world who get, get sick. Everyone in this room and their family would get sick at some point in, uh, in life, and that affordable health care would be beneficial. But we attacked it and tra instead of trying to correct it, fix it, and make it applicable to the citizens and the taxpayers. I say that to say that the issue with the corner is an issue that can be corrected. It does not need to be a consistent, ongoing belittling, defamation of character, uh, legal ramifications to put someone in jail or to defame their person. So I say to the Board of Commissioners, what keeps you sustained? Blood, air, water. At what point do we stop being civil and stop being human? I come here to say, let's get back to civility. Let's get back to being human. Let's get back to family and community, or we'll continuously divide. And as it applies to the mass shootings, that wasn't done out of love. That was not done out of love. That's done out of pure hatred for people who do not know each other but yet think they have the ability to correct life and say it should be one race and one race only. I got a problem with that because it will never be, never has been, and will never be one race. People, let's wake up and realize what's going on. We can stop it or we can compatulate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Benoit. We appreciate that uh, message. Um, and as chairman of this Douglas County Board of Commissioners, I, I appreciate it. And I believe and I say wholeheartedly that we are one Douglas, and I believe that there is love among us. And I'm hoping that your words have just uh, put, a, uh, I call it a ray of sunshine over this county, and I, and I believe we are. So I'm going to think positive as I go forward today, and hopefully that uh, since this particular instance in this case is over uh, regarding our coroner that uh, this county can get back to business as usual so we can get some things accomplished because I'm a leader that like to get things done and I don't like a lot of mess. So and, and, and so thank you. So we're going to move on. Uh, Board of Commissioners, you have your approval of your minutes. Uh, your, and I ask that you look at those tomorrow and uh, be prepared to approve accordingly. And we're going to go straight into our business items and we uh, we have a relatively short uh, agenda today, so let's see if we can press through. Uh, business items, we have tab number four, approval of a preliminary plat for Palmer Falls. We have our own Ron Roberts. How you doing? 
Good morning, sure. Madam Good morning. Chair. Good morning. Yes, before you is a, a plenary plat for approval of Madam Chair's signature for Palmer Falls. I have with me today Jim Garrigus as well. Um, if you have any questions or anything about this particular item, Madam Chair. Um, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? I'm just happy that it's moving. Um, but, um, Vice Chairman Blackson. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate, you know, Palmer Falls has been a, a long time in coming. Um, um, James Worthington, I, um, his involvement earlier on when we had to sort of um, get it unstuck. Um, it was part of the Pike Farm, Pike City Incomplete Community that we thought was um, important. This administration took on housing um, straight ahead. We invested, what, this time last year, about $600,000 with WSA to really, you know, sort of stimulate the economy. And you're very effective in that. And, and to see all the, um, everything from Holly Springs and from the different places that we're actually seeing building, it, 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 it's very um, refreshing. That being said, um, so how many, is it 200? 298 lots. All right. Preliminary plan. Preliminary right. so, plan. So here's the question. We, we had the planning and zoning meeting. We fixed sort of the interest in the et cetera. When do we think um, building will commence? Do you know? Give or take. I don't, but I was talking with Jim right before the meeting, yep. Commissioner, and he said that so once preliminary plat has been approved, then he's got about 31 lots in phase 2A that he's going to be bringing forward to us later this week. Okay. Um, second question is that also, uh, one of the challenges that we had with Palmer Falls with, with incomplete communities was the um, uh, unfulfilled amenities, right? And it goes back to what I call it a broken promise, which is what the whole commitment of, of, of that whole area was to restore to the original vision that, that was intended. So um, as it relates to moving into <coughs> phase two for us one more time, uh, refresh us. I know we talked about it during the planning and zoning, but what about the amenities that um, obviously those um, citizens came and, yes, and fought so hard to get restored. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, so, with the condition nine, as 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 you as you mentioned from the planning and zoning meeting, was that uh, the, upon issuance of the 170 building permit, um, they will move forward with uh, phase one of the amenities package that was uh, originally um, discussed. Okay, so so we're still in agreement. That still stands. Everything's um, still in agreement. Everything still stands. The residents, as you know left the uh, planning and zoning meeting uh, that back in May completely joyous and very, very happy that this was moving forward. Okay. All right. and, I, and again, I do appreciate my, my fellow commissioners for voting for that, getting that passed in planning and zoning. So uh, last question. So this is just preliminary plan. I mean, that's all you need is for us to prove this and they're off to the races. Is that that's correct? There will be off to the races and it'll just require a Madam Chair's signature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, related to this, and speaking of, of, of this, and, and we talked about pipe farms, um, uh, this is related. Um, um, well, I'll, I'll take it off. Okay. Let it go. Any questions? Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, did you mention? Oh, hold on one minute. <laughs> so I, I think the answer, right? Commissioner Guider. Uh, this is phase two. Did you say phase two? Um, well, no, it's a, it's a 2A and a 2B. It's a 2A and a 2B. The preliminary plat covers the 290 lots, not 298 lots that, that, that will be built. What I was saying is that now that they get the preliminary plat, they'll come back with a final plat for the first, for, for 2A, 31 lots, which will, they'll start um, this week. And you, and you feel that once these other homes are built, uh, I assume the funds that the existing homeowners have been paying into for amenities or their home, HOA, mm -hmm. uh, they're still intact? Are they still out there? Uh, because when you buy the house, you have to pay into it the first year. So I mean, I'm, so, I'm, so are I'm asking, funds is someone in charge of the HOA? That's yes, they they have a very they're very active HOA, um, and there was uh, some representatives that Commissioner Robinson and and Stat and, and James and I met with um, several months back. They're actually managing the HOA. And you feel that once these other homes there, that the amenities that were promised will be uh, built. That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. So for clarity. How far off before the amenities package being built? 
so we kind of get, get a clarity on that. Would it be after 2B is done or in the process of 2B? And I don't know if you can answer that or I'm assuming it sounds well, like you. Yeah, as these Go 30... To the, the Come to the podium, yeah, please. Uh, Jim, Jim Garrigus with St. Burke Development. Okay. Um, the whole arrangement with the, uh, the modifications that were done mm -hmm. earlier in the year is as we close every lot, and there will be 31 all at once, $10,000 goes into an escrow. And from that, <clears throat> those funds go on out to start construction on the amenity. So That will be after you build all of no, that's after we sell the lot. So okay. we're, we're starting the plans for the amenity right now. Mm -hmm. And so that should be breaking ground. It'll probably be, we have to go through all that approval process. Phase one of the amenity should be breaking ground early next year. What is phase one of the amenity? Phase it is, is parking two. lot and tennis courts. And then we just keep adding to that as right. more lots are sold. So thank you. Well, phase one of the amenities package is the parking lots and the, 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 the uh, tennis courts. Yeah, phase and phase two, two would be the pool clubhouse. The pool and clubhouse. And would, that, and would, that, and that, would that be all that's, that's part of the package, the, the amenities package? Pool, right. uh, tennis courts. Pool clubhouse and tennis clubhouse. courts. That's, that's what it package. always has been, yeah. And with that, until you get rid of the first 10 lots you said or 20 lots or well, the 30, these 30 31 months. that are being sold now will generate $310,000. Yeah, and that'll get you the that, tennis court and the parking lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then you'll move it into the next 20 or 30 or however. Yeah. That, it just that, keeps going on. That, that, those, are, those, are the, those are the phases, I'm assuming, that we're going to go through. There's really just two phases. Two yeah. phases. Okay, so that's the first phase. And then when the second phase is done, then with the, the minutes act will be complete. Yes, that's right. Before, during, or after. Phase two B. Well, it'll phase one of the amenity package because right. that's the three hundred and ten thousand will be generally done as those thirty one homes are being built. Understood. You know, it's kind of concurrent. Mm -hmm. And then phase two will have to wait for additional lot sales to generate the additional funds to to do that clubhouse and yeah. everything else mm -hmm. and, and, we and, plan and to go we don't know the answer to the question of, of what i'm getting to is yeah it's uh, it's hard to project right you don't right. know what the market is but um that should be ongoing through next year 2020. got it got it and, and the homeless associ the homeless association president or whomever else that's kind of yeah. representing these guys are all in understanding oh, sure. that this process won't be it won't happen it won't overnight, be overnight. Right. it'll be in phases it'll yeah. be in phases and they and Ron, these guys have been cleared on understanding this whole makeup, correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Right. The, the planning is only meeting uh, back in May. They were very, very clear. The point was made. Right, right. I remember. Yeah. So I just want to make sure. I'm, I'm just doing it for the public, so the public will right. understand. Right. Kind of. That's not changing whatsoever. We're just following through on what was done earlier this year. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. And I deal. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roberts. Tab number five, authorization to approve a contract with Besson Croup Elevator to maintain the elevator in the government annex building and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Our Director Worthington, how are you this morning? Good, good. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as you said, this is a contract for <coughs> this Croup Elevator to maintain the elevator. There's a single elevator in the tax and tag annex building. Um, it's basically, in simple terms, it's a it's a bumper to bumper warranty. Yep. It's two hundred fifty dollars a month for a one year contract. Legal's been through the contract and is satisfied. Uh, it covers all the maintenance, any repairs, parts, labor, everything's included, with just a few exceptions for after hours or stuff like that. But should be good. Okay. Any questions from the board? Sounds good. I'm going to bump those one of the questions I had. That's one of the questions I had for the county administrator when we had when we reviewed our agenda, my agenda for this meeting. And I said, is it part of the warranty package? So it sounds like it's just bumper to bumper. Right. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to tab number six, authorization to apply for the Edward Burns Memorial Justice Assistance Grant JAG program in the amount of $16,419 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents 
Jennifer King, and by the way, congratulations on your new position. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Director, uh, can you give us your title again so I won't blow Director it. of Juvenile Programs Administration. She re uh, replaced uh, Jenny McDade, and we really appreciate Mrs. McDade's many years of service. So, awesome. would you tell us what you got here? Yes, ma'am. This is um, a grant that we've been getting since about 2013. Um, nicknamed JAG grant, the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant, Assistance Grant, an amount of $16,419. Um, this money is used to serve um, kind of a high-risk group of kids, younger ages, um, in services. Any questions from the board? Uh, Commissioner Carthen. Good morning. Can you tell me a, what link youth is? Yes. <laughs> um, the state requires each county to have a group called um, LIPT, which is um, Integrating Partners as a Team. Um, our version is called LINK. So uh, Ms. Hopson in my office chairs this program. They meet twice a month with um, various agencies and treatment providers <coughs> and staff these children. A lot of them have um, severe mental health issues, a lot of educational issues. So we come together as a team to make sure services are in place. Um, if there is an out-of-home placement needed, how we get to that. Some of them are in placements and then coming back into the community. So they put together plans to make sure everything's in place for these kids and families. So the resources that are used from this particular grant, are they resources such as what CSB, our Community Service Board, does? Do you? It could be with CSB. It could be any of the local um, providers here in the county, depending on what they need. It could be something that Tanner provides or Willowbrook. It, it's not like one provider. It's anybody. Okay. Thank you for that idea. Okay. Thank you. We want to have some commission Mitchell. So, are there any matching portions on our end of this? There is not. No matching, okay. Mm -hmm. And back to the CSB uh, portion. So, how intertwined and or conversations or anything that's been had with the guys over at CSB, none? None. They're just a referral source. Um, Who is a referral? Refer the the source? Community Services Board we use as a referral source. Maybe okay. if a family um, does not have insurance. They can go over there, complete an assessment, see what they qualify for, and they provide a sliding scale for them to pay for those services. That would be you then paying, I'm not you, but the grant for doing paying for that sliding scale. I'm a little confused. No, okay, no, I'm understand. sorry. Okay. CSB, we don't use them very often. Um, Why? Just some of the different programs that they've offered in the past. For us in particular, um, we are reaching back out to them now with some of the new changes with the split between Douglas and Cobb Got to it. see what is now available and if it meets kind of our criteria because um, these are, are in need of a lot of services. Right. Um, <clears throat> so right now it's just kind of a place that we might have to send somebody. A lot of our local providers um, are providing in-home counseling. Um, office counseling. They also have some psychiatrists that they're connected to or on board. So we're able to, to kind of funnel the different locations. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't CSB offer though at least some of those things you mentioned? But I'm For not the sure most all of part. the services that, okay. Yeah, and some, sometimes like with their psychiatrist, it may take you a couple months or so to get in to see someone. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends. You know, we, we kind of have to classify out what's the most important need and how quickly we can get it in for the fan drive. So the delay would be them not able to get you to that particular resource that you need in a yes. timely fashion. Yes. But you're now trying to work with them or Absolutely. trying to see some with the changes that have actually haven't been made, you know, from uh, the new leadership, I guess I'll call it. Yes, yes. We, we develop relationships with any provider that we can mm -hmm. so that we do have kind of an array of what fits, you know, each family and their situation. I understand. And I, and I know each situation will differ. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, you know, can't say which, you know, but I just want to make sure that we are using the resources that we already have. Yes. <laughs> the funding and, and things that we're getting, grants or whatever, that we don't duplicate something unnecessarily when we got oh, it right. Oh, no. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll yield back. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. The 
Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on this, and we, we, the board recognizes that the community service board um, is going where it wasn't before. We'll put it that way. Now, use how you say that's probably the, the, the best way to say it, which is um, duly noted on the past, we're moving forward, we're progressing. And so, to the extent that you did the best you could, what you had, um, there was an opportunity to tie back in, but to Commissioner Mitchell's point, there needs to at least be an acknowledgement. Uh, but um, as opposed to being as opposed to being duplication only, I'm always about leverage, leveraging capacity, right? Leveraging our capital stack to a bigger picture, right? Because I guess my question becomes: um, Is there pent up demand? Is there a need for um, providing these services to at risk youth? Um, is there a need for true child advocacy here in Douglas County um, at a level that where we can it, it becomes sustainable It's one thing to do sort of what I call you know sort of uh, it, it's charitable we can help and you know goodwill but are we really committed to providing these services and that means it needs to become a little bit more um, structurally sound and so um, talk to me about that is there a need for that have we grown to that point where okay we've got to go to a whole another level uh, because of the capacity issues can we talk about that I think we're we're certainly in a in the right direction, okay. um, and and part of that is in my office. Not only do we have this program, you know, we have our family drug court. We have an intake program working with kids who are new to the system. You know, we have a chins program for certain offenses. We we have an array <laughs> of families, so we are constantly um, reaching out, meeting with providers to meet all of those needs. Um, also, Ms. Hobson in my office does our yearly resource guide. She is in the process now of updating that through all of these providers, what they do, what cost, if there's insurance, all of those things will be in a nice little booklet that we give out to people. Um, Don't leave that point right there. there. There used to be a resource guide that used to be, is that the same resource guide that CORE used to provide? I don't know where it came out, but every year there was like this little booklet. And we, we funded it as part of that $50,000 um, that the Board of Commissioners so kindly committed to mental health. But we, we funded it through CORE. Um, it, it, is that the same resource guide? Because now I'm concerned, do we have two resource guides um, out there? Or? I, I, I know several years ago there was, there was one that CORE did. That's several years ago. Uh, um, Jill's been doing this one, I want to say four or five years now. Um, it's compiled with her through the office, um, we have, I don't, I know we have provided print versions. We also have a PDF that we can email out um, okay. to people. You know, we've shared that with law enforcement, anybody, you know, if they come in the door and they're looking for something specific that we can't help them with, we'll right. mark that guide and give it to them. All right, and I, I won't belabor, this is my last point, which is to, to, to that point, um, I was at to, this prayer of reference and that, um, um, Golden Corral recently, and you know, and the ladies in there, about 30 ladies in there, were asking for resources. You know, what what resources did we have? And I thought about that book, and I just mm -hmm. didn't have. But what I'm what I'm talking about has only been in the past couple of years. Um, I did um, a trainer trainer for mental health over at the Douglasville's um, Center over there on Fairburn Boulevard um, in, in their magistrate building. Um, now we'll just take this offline, then yeah, I want to just double back and make sure we can. Maybe. You remember if it had red and black writing on the front? One was small, guys. A little <laughs> small one. It's called Community Service Resource Guide Link or something like that. It was what Amanda Bryant was responsible for creating. I've, I've, I've got it around here somewhere. But we won't, we won't belabor the, the agenda. I'm sure needs to keep moving. So I'm fine. I'll take it offline. Welcome to the party. I know we're asking a lot of questions, but, but thank you I'm for good, being here. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you so thank much. You. All right. We're going to move on to tab number seven. Uh, authorization to approve uh, SYF, uh, I'm sorry, F, S, F, Y, 2020 uh, aging services contract with the Atlanta Regional Commission and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Dr. Gilchrist, if you could provide, you hit the ground running with ARC and we met last week and you shared with me, uh, shared with me some of the great things that you're uh, working on uh, with ARC. So if you could just take it from here. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. This is our um, Senior Services Annual Contract with the Atlanta Region Commission. The contract provides funding for home-delivered meals, which is our Meals on Wheels program, our homemaker and case management 
services. The contract is in the amount of $590,682.62 um, with the payment amount being $554,201.13. We have a local match of $36,481, which we provide through units of services by going over and beyond what's required in the contract. Okay. Any questions from the board? Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, you threw a lot of figures out there. What's in it for Douglas County? Well, the <laughs> What's citizens, Douglas County's portion, I guess. It's the $36,481. Okay, because I heard the 500 and something thousand, and my ears just really perked up there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So we're, uh, and that goes to the Meals on Wheels? Meals on Wheels, um, also our case management services, and our homemaker services. So, is this our only funding for Meals on Wheels? Uh, it's through, through, ARC. through the ARC, yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. I thought it came from the state. Somehow. All right. I yield back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I think she answered my question. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to tab number eight, authorization to award on demand consulting services contracts to the firms of Michael Baker Corporation, Southeastern Engineering Corporation, C, I mean GCA, Pond, Niels, Schaefer, uh, BM, and KHL uh, Engineers Incorporation, THC, Corey Engineering LLC, Medina, and Wilson, I mean Wilborn, and Low Engineers to provide services for the transportation projects as needed by the county and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents, Director Valentin. Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Um, this mm -hmm. effort uh, has been probably underway for three to four months now, and we've talked about it peripherally at a number of meetings. Essentially, what we're looking to do is to streamline the process of project delivery. One of the first elements that we have to engage in uh, on a project is to get a design done. And in the past, every time we would need services, design services, we would have to package together a, a RFQ or a proposal and advertise for a month and then go through the process of awarding the design contract. What this will do is we've essentially combined all of the different types of services that we would normally need to accomplish that into one RFQ, which will qualify uh, many vendors, many consultants, to be able to do all of the components. Now, uh, because we wanted to uh, guard against the possibility that we would have some of the larger players, some of the larger design firms, uh, be the ones that get uh, all of the work, we split up the effort into 11 different service areas, 11 different categories. And some of those areas, there are smaller firms that are qualified to do that work. And uh, in essence, we were trying to give them the opportunity to bid as a prime, independent of all the other um, larger players in the business. So. Uh, we've gone through the process of um, qualifying the firms, a uh, two-stage process, and uh, the, the recommendation uh, this morning for your consideration is to award those contracts. Uh, these are on-demand service contracts. They carry no value. Essentially, they commit the firm to be ready and available to service the county's needs when those needs arise. It does not obligate the county to use any or all of them, and it does not obligate the county to only use this process uh, going forward uh, to accomplish work. In fact, there, there are uh, certain projects that are specialized enough, or they might be of a, a, a very convoluted uh, nature and we in those instances we would go through the process independent so we could be looking at qualifying firms that are specific to those types of projects. So 
uh, 11 different service areas um, that are the things that we normally use to be able to uh, move the projects forward. And again, the, pro the contracts carry no value at this point. What would happen is upon, if, if it be the consensus of the board to move forward, uh, uh, upon these contracts being in place, we would reach out to the firms that have been qualified with more specific scopes of services for projects that we have been discussing over the last several months. For example, along State Route 92, we have three or four different intersections that we've talked about uh, where we need services. The services may be just initially an analysis of the need, uh, or it could lead to a full design if, if the decision is to move forward. Uh, State Route 92 and Anawake, State Route 92 and Riverside, uh, 92 and Mount Vernon. We potentially uh, may need some additional work there. Hopefully not, because we're closer on that one. Uh, State Route 92 and Earl E. Lee Boulevard. Uh, we're looking to analyze that intersection to see if it can be reconfigured to improve safety. Uh, Highway 5 at Boulevard, uh, or Douglas Boulevard, Northbound right turn lane. That's also another project. Uh, Liberty Road, the I-20 entrance ramp on the eastbound direction. The possibility of signalizing that is also another one. The sidewalks on Thor uh, Maxim Road to connect the, the project at Thornton all the way, uh, the sidewalks to connect the sidewalks to Cuff County. So, so those are some of the uh, examples of things that we would move forward uh, upon award of, uh, of these uh, contracts. Again, these contracts carry zero commitment, zero value at this point. It would be upon floating a task order and coming back with a definitive proposal that the county would be looking at potentially investing uh, funds. Okay, thank you. Any <coughs> questions from board commissioners, Vice Chairman Robinson? I, I know you weigh in regarding transportation. I'm not quite sure uh, uh, Commissioner Carthen has. She's Would you, you want to go first? Or? Um, I do. Let me have time to see. I didn't have my hand raised, but she did. All right, okay. Yeah. Um, All right. I, I know you probably want to weigh in on that person, <laughs> piece. I'm sorry. So, All right, so let me finish my. Let me initiate my thoughts on this. Um, this is something that uh, we're going we're gonna to back up just for a minute. Um, BM, before Miguel, uh, we, we looked at what we want to call standby <coughs> contract provision, 10 contracts a few years ago. And um, um, novel idea uh, with this, in the spirit of the same thing, uh, being a little bit more expeditious. Um, that was based on mechanical engineer, civil engineer, whatever the, the engineering categories were. Uh, and it was meritorious, we just, at that time, wasn't in a position to really exercise that. And so the contracts came and uh, was a, they had their year expiration and that was pretty much it, right? And so now we have a new era, no problem. Uh, as context, uh, in looking at this, um, this is something that we have been talking about this on the side um, for quite some time. Um, I'm going to only speak for transportation at this moment. Um, recognizing I do sit on purchasing, but um, um, when, when this was presented to purchasing and ultimately made it to transportation, my concern was, and so this does not come with a recommendation from the transportation committee. That's important. All right, so we're going to award 10, 11 contracts with no Commissioner Insight, no committee scrubbing, no committee review. That bothers me. It bothers me because you, what this does, and I heard the operative word, task orders, you award this, somebody gets, they get to ride for up to one, maybe two, maybe three years. Now, my, my, when, when this came before the Transportation Committee, I mean, I, it was one of those where, okay, let, let's make sure we understand what we're looking at. And, and it, it was, in, in, but in presenting it to the, to the Transportation Committee, after <coughs> leaving the Purchasing Committee, there was no detail at all. No detail. 
And the premise was, well, wait a minute, you want me to make a recommendation to my full board of commissioners with no detail? And the comment was, it won't make a difference. Okay. Now that I had an issue with. You're like, okay, now I'm gonna have to look deeper into this. To um, that, that, and, and now this is B BM. This is you wouldn't know this experience I had when we not know our director, he, um, purchasing, um, or di our director of, of development services. When we're dealing with performance contracts, and contracts were trying to be awarded with no detail. This is when we had that con ed. And I said, Chairman Worthen, these guys were pitching with no, like, what? All right, we had to throw that back and start all over, and of course, we went a different direction. The reason we put a committee structure in place here is to allow, um, in Madam Chair's wisdom, is to allow to get <coughs> buy-in, get one or two <coughs> members to buy-in before it even reaches the full board of commissioners. To roll through two committees to award this set of contracts for this period of time, with no detail other than just some conversation, that, that becomes a concern. Um, I, I, I couldn't support that just on that alone. Now, in, 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 my, in my leadership, like, okay, look, you, we really don't want to do this, right? I, I'd hate to throw this back, because I know we need to keep things working, but you can't just sort of dismiss, no one is above the check and balance process. No one. I understand that directors have authority. Some of them have theirs written in local ordinance and stuff at the state. I get it. No one is exempt from check and balance. Right? And so if I'm looking at, you know, as the chairman of the committee trying to look, look, I'm trying to, I support this. We put much money into transportation. But just got to go both ways. It's not a rubber stamp. We just don't, yes to the wishes. All right, so then I'm going to wrap my comments up because i got to yield to the other commissioners. But for me, to just I, I, I could not support this just by the fact that there was no, um, I, I didn't think it was, it, it didn't hit right. right? Um, for a director to tell the commissioner it won't make a difference, that when I bring it, I'm going to bring it and you got to take it at base value. Now, Recognizing that in the absence, I have to say this, in the absence of another person that came around, and I'm sitting in there, and I, I had to step up and be the chair of the moment, just as a proxy not to, to be, to run it. And I lean over the county ministry, and I'm like, okay, now y'all know this is about to happen. It would behoove, it would behoove you to talk to your director and have them come back around and say, like, all you had to do, it, even in that meeting, like, won't y'all meet with Commissioner Robinson or whomever afterwards and try to reconcile with their peace? But to outright say it ain't gonna make a difference and nobody moved, it's like, oh yeah, I want a train wreck. And it's about the respect of the moment. It's about respect of the process. That 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 was my fundamental issue. It's respect. It's respect. Right? And so I, I, I tried to move it along. You try to give an olive branch and say, come on now, you you know we can't do this like that. And does it even meet the spirit of where we wanted it to go? So I'm gonna pause on that from a uh, I told y'all this was going to come back around. I said I would get out your way. Let this come as full, uh, I called it administrative concurrence. I go to the full board. But there's no way I can support something based on the premise I had no visibility. Now, you have the detail now, but the whole point of the committees were to, to, to get into this. So I'm going to yield for now and we're going to let others weigh in. Now, uh, if I need Commissioner, to come back, I will. If I, if I may respond, if I may clarify, my, my comment about um, and I don't think I use the term, it won't make a difference, but I was referring to uh, one of the handouts that I presented at, at the uh, Transportation Committee meeting that had the recommendations and the ranking of the various firms. When um, there was a request for additional detail, my reference was, we can provide you with the detail of how we arrived at this recommendation, but it will not affect the ranking, the, the final recommendation. That was my point. Not that the committee doesn't have jurisdiction. Essentially, we were, pre I presented the final outcome of the process and indicated 
I can provide you additional detail about the process, but the final recommendation of the process is what you have, and that will not change. I have to respond, because remember, I was the one to ask the question, right? So you can't give me the answer that you want me to have. I wanted more detail because it was too, it was too, this is too big of an award. You will lock out, if we had the same conversation with your predecessor, you're going to lock out everybody else for the next three years that perhaps could do this. And it was just, I needed more detail. I, I mean, I just, I, we, we went from purchasing department, you guys were working behind the scenes, and we have no detail. We, I'm trying to see how you're awarding this. And to not show me your hand, it's like, no, I can't just, you can't, it's the same thing about BM, uh, when, when, with this whole Con Ed, when they manufactured, um, what I call they manufactured results, right? And, and you're leading it down a certain path, and the whole point of, of this process, like, I should be involved at least to see it, right? Give me assurance. I'm the one asking the questions. I'm the one trying to, you, you're asking for my vote. You have to answer in a way that I'm comfortable. And so if I needed that detail, that was important. You can't marginalize or invalidate or try to sidestep what I'm asking for. And so that's it's like, okay, but are you, you, you're so busy wanting to show, show me what you want me to see, but you're not answering my question and giving me assurance, and that's why I got out your way. I wasn't gonna make it a big deal. It's like, okay, well, you're not listening to me. You can't hear me. I'll catch you later. So let's not belabor this. You, you, you've responded. I've, I've done the rebuttal. Madam Chair, let, let's close me out and let somebody else, please. Thank you so much, yes, ma'am. Vice Chairman, I'll move on to Commissioner Guyton. Mm -hmm. Yes, Miguel. Speak um, up. No. I would like for someone to explain the chart to me. <laughs> I'm trying to make sense out of the chart. It's got color coded, then it's got numbers, then it's got little numbers, big numbers, and it's. Uh, it makes no sense to me whatsoever, but I would like, before we vote on it, I'd like somebody to come into my office and explain it to me. And also, um, uh, you have these uh, companies rated uh, by some means, but um, what if there's just one company that does one thing? So you're not gonna go out and bid, you're just gonna reach out to that one company? Would that be the intent? There, there are multiple companies that could do services in a particular area. For example, for uh, title searches. And, and, uh, uh, let's just take bridge. Uh, I saw one, uh, something about a bridge. Yes, bridge service. And there was just one company on there. There, there, there are two, I believe. Michael Baker was qualified oh, yeah, for bridges. Oh yeah, way over here, okay. Yes. So what, what happened, and, and to your earlier question about the numbers, essentially those were the points awarded to them are in parentheses for that particular phase. And the, and the larger number is the rank based on how many bid for that service. So if there were five that were vying to become certified in that service, then their scores are reflected point scores and then they're ranking one through five. That's what the numbers mean. Okay, well, it, that makes a little bit more sense to me, but when I was looking at it, man, I couldn't figure out anything. <laughs> but, um, but you would just really reach out to the people on this list, the companies on this list, to bid on the project that we had coming forward. We still have competitive bid, bidding. That's what I'm concerned about. Well, essentially, for professional services, you don't you don't bid it in terms of uh, awarding to the lowest bid. You you enter into negotiations. You give them a scope of services for example, <coughs> for the design of Highway Five, the turn lane of Highway Five and Boulevard. We have a scope of services that we then reach back out to those qualified firms and say, okay, I want a proposal for you to do this scope of services. And then that's what we so will So you bring. write the specs and then sit down with them. Correct. That's what you're saying. Correct. Okay. Miguel, and that's brought back to the board to approve. That would come back to the board for approval. Okay. There's nothing yes. Okay, done I'm just the board concerned, approved. what if there's just one company that does a specific job? Would you just have one company sit down? Not necessarily. We, we would reach out to them. See, before we 
<coughs> negotiate with them, we have to know or have a good sense of what the scope is and what the cost ought to be. So when they come back with a number, if it's out of line, we would try to negotiate and get the numbers closer. And if that fails, there's nothing prohibiting us from going back out with another document, a proposal, independent of this. We would just have to take the time to yeah, advertise. These people are just sitting and waiting. Yes. Uh, they, they would be, uh, we would be a priority customer of theirs. Right? Correct. All right, with that, I give back. Thank you. And I believe uh, you're showing you're chasing efficiency. But I want to wait on this and allow the uh, commissioners, particularly um, both commissioners, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson has requested his, some additional detail. And uh, Commissioner Carthen, uh, not Carthen, but uh, Geiger, has just uh, indicated that she would like to understand the graph. So we just pull it off for tomorrow and allow them to look at it, and then we'll just hopefully, I, I'd like to see it in two weeks. I want to see it come back. So we'll sure. just spend a little more time on it. And uh, Commissioner Carthen, I believe you have a comment. Mm -hmm. It, yeah, I was about to say it, that. It, Thank you. The it, it, it does well. need to come to the purchasing committee as well. Um, I would like to open it up. Um, 11 is a small number to me, and I think I expressed that to you. 11 is just not enough. We're really going to be competitive. Um, and I'd like to see this open up. I'd like to see what other means can we get so that we can get more companies because we know supply and demand drives everything, right? So if we have more people out there that we can put these services out to, we will probably get our numbers in line so that we won't spend as much. One of the things that we have going on now with the spas, as you and I talked about, is that you know the bids <coughs> come back and they're over what we need. We will award it and then we have to go back and update it because they keep coming back with overages. We want to stop that so that we can really rein in our costs as a board. So um, I believe if we could expand this list, it will better meet what you need going forward and what we need as a board to rein in our costs. So um, I'm in alignment with Commissioner um, Chairwoman about let's let's go back and let's let's revamp this and, and do it again. But I yield. And uh, if you could, uh, Commissioner Carthen, uh, in your committee for the mm -hmm. purchasing of site, if you could just take a look at, I'd just like to see how much we've spent this year on task orders to change the amount of change money. orders on um, change orders. To how, many, how much money we've spent? Because we really need to get a handle on that. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the Commissioner. Uh, did you have anything? Does well, I, 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 I mean, I think you guys did a good <laughs> job at kind of sending it back. So I'll, I'll defer back to uh, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, caught that in reference to it goes back there and, and it kind of jump starts there versus to us at this very moment. So I'm going to defer mm -hmm. back to transportation. And both. Well, trans well, yeah, back to you guys. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah. And then, it, I mean, whether it takes a it meeting or two, I'm not only concerned about how long it takes, but I'd rather hear you guys' recommendation first. So. Just one other question. Mm -hmm. Is this going to delay Highway 5? Yes. <laughs> we can't just build out one project. It would take longer to do that than the two week. Uh, because we do period. have a timeline on Highway 5 in order to get half of it paid by the city. Understood. But uh, unfortunately, uh, without these contracts in place, we would have to prepare a package and advertise for a month to be able to get uh, proposals back before you. And all that's spelled out by state law? That is actually federal. Federal? On um, whether it's a county road or uh, it, it, state no, highway? No, that is for any project that has federal funds. You have to go through that process. Mm -hmm. The state also requires that process when they're doing the work. If we're doing work on a state route, they look for us to adhere by that process. Mm -hmm. Now, if it were on a camp, strictly on a county road, county project, we wouldn't have to do that. Okay. okay. And I make some, some parameters. Hopefully, we'll be able to have this, this discussion in our next work session. I believe we have a transportation committee meeting. I'm not sure when our next purchasing uh, meeting is. Is it within the, the next two weeks? Mm -hmm. Okay. So hopefully, we have something. 
All right, well, we'll move on to the next item, tab number nine, authorization to advertise for a public hearing for the purpose of considering amending section 14-72, zones prohibiting trucks with more than, no more than six wheels uh, of the county code of ordinances to designate portions of Tyree Road and East Carroll Road as a road segment where the truck over six wheels restriction is applicable. Uh, Director Valentin again. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we've gotten a number of complaints uh, about trucks utilizing Tyree Road in particular, and to some extent Liberty Road okay. as well. Uh, so the, the board may consider adding that to, to this uh, particular item. Uh, essentially, with, uh, with Post Road being uh, out of commission, the trucks have found ways to get around traveling north-south. And uh, although Post Road Bridge is going to reopen hopefully in another couple of weeks, once the truckers learn a particular route, they remember. And so we're looking to implement the restriction that unless they have business, uh, either a delivery or a pickup along the, those routes, they're supposed to stay on the designated routes. And um, the designated routes in the county are essentially the state routes as the primary routes, truck routes. And there are a couple, a handful of secondary truck routes, such as Post Road and uh, Lee Road. Uh, those are uh, recognized as if the other main routes are not available because of an accident or some other reason, then trucks <coughs> would be allowed to use those roads. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, I don't believe you have a question. Miguel, I think the public's misunderstanding this. I think they think we're adding them to allow trucks with six wheels. No. That's, what I, that's the emails I'm getting. That they think that we're going to allow all these trucks to go on Tyree Road, East Carroll, and um, now Liberty. And I place. hear complaints all the time yeah. to the contrary. They, they don't want the, the, road, the big tractor trailers on these roads, right? Yeah, the, the, uh, the intent is to add those roads to a list where, where trucks are prohibited. <coughs> so it's not to allow for trucks. Well, I read that, I read it four times, and I, I kept thinking, now I'm reading it different than them, but they're reading it to be that we're saying it's okay to have yeah, these yeah. trucks on those roads. Those but we're adding it to kind of like a, a no truck. Correct. Road. Okay, I need to um, counter that with all these emails I'm getting. <laughs> all right, thank you. And, and uh, thank you. is there a consensus as to whether Liberty Road yeah, should be Yeah, I want you to add Liberty on there because they, that, it connects with uh, Tyree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe Mark and I met with Ms. Chelsea, that was a question she had for me on Friday regarding that liberty. That's where it really originally started both Tyree and Liberty. Okay. Um, Commissioner Carthen. Director Miguel, can you tell us when you are going to have um, input from the citizens regarding this? Um, this is essentially a request to have a public hearing. So the public hearing would have to be advertised, and they're typically held during commission meetings, mm -hmm. and so we would have to look at the advertising period, which is at least two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so it probably would be sometime in September when we would have a public hearing to have input from the public. <coughs> one, of, one of the complaints that we are receiving is that it's during these meetings and people can't get here because they're working but it affects them that that would be a consideration for the board we could um, the board could decide to schedule the public hearing when you have the evening meeting in September okay. that would be a possibility I just want that to be noted in the minutes so that people will know that we are pushing for their voices to be heard and that you are willing to hear them out and answer the question? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, I'm going to move on to the next tab. Tab 10, authorization to award a contract to Carter Watkins Associate Architects and Corporation for Architectural Services in connection with the renovation and reconstruction of the DOT maintenance facility on Chicago Avenue and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentini, once again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, we need to have an architect take a look at the, uh, the structure. Uh, that was damaged by the fire mm -hmm. and make an assessment as to how much of it needs to be uh, rehabbed. There, there are steel members that need to be replaced and so uh, this is to facilitate that effort. Uh, the architect would develop options for the county to move forward uh, as it relates to rehab of that building. Okay, any questions for the board? <coughs> All right, well, thank you. Sounds like we're moving in the right direction. Tab number 11, consideration of proposed merit system changes as recommended by the Personnel Review Board regarding section 13-8, same compensation, uh, then also 1319G Personnel Review Board, 13-17, positions covered, and 13-42, salary reviews, and 13-124, vacation leave, and 13-122, holidays. Director Perry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chair, these are the uh, six proposed recommendations uh, for changes to the merit system that we bring forth annually. Mm -hmm. uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with all the commissioners regarding this, and uh, just at this period in time, I don't want uh, to move forward with a vote or anything. I just want consideration to be given. Uh, within the next, I think, uh, two weeks, we'll be coming around to have further discussion about them, and then we'll put them on the agenda. Uh, for for, uh, for change, okay. for official change. So this is just simply for discussion. Yep. With no, no vote tomorrow. But yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep. You have it, clerk. We're not going to vote on tab number eleven. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, just, just one comment on proposal number three. I think you may be misinterpreting what they're trying to accomplish. So you need to talk to somebody on the personnel review board. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioners, okay, I'm going to move on to tab number 12, <coughs> authorization to award a contract to Headley Construction for the rideshare facility construction and renovation for amount not to exceed $1,364,000 and authorize the children to sign all related documents pending legal review. Uh, Director Peacock. Yes, ma'am. We uh, rebid this project back out uh, with the due date of uh, July the 30th. We received uh, five responses back. Uh, again, this is for the uh, rideshare facility uh, construction of about 6,000 square feet of additional space, uh, and as well as some renovation within the existing rideshare uh, facility. Uh, we Again, we received five responses back. Um, we have attached the tabulation of those five to the agenda item. We're asking that the contract be awarded to Headley based on the fact that um, they were uh, compliant with all of the things that we had requested, all of the uh, points we had requested in the uh, bid, as well as they met the 10% DBE requirement or request that we had put into the proposal. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Director Peacock. Certainly, this is a federal grant related to the DBE, and I would like to just uh, extend uh, thanks to Commissioner Carthen, who is the Chairman of the Purchasing Oversight Committee, along with the Vice Chairman of the Committee, uh, Commissioner Robinson, for taking the time and due diligence to kind of look at some things that I had initial concerns about, but it sounds like it all played out for the best and, and everything is uh, legitimate and above board and balanced. So, thank you so much also. I direct the Peacock for your hard work as well. So any questions from the board on this one? Uh, Commissioner Guyman. Uh, just one thing, do we have the recommendation from that board? We do. Yes, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned I it. I didn't yes. see it attached. Okay. Thank you. I go back. Okay, no problem. I'll move on to the next item, tab number 13. Authorization to award contracts to Roadside Specialist Highway Services Incorporation and Peak Pavement Market LLC to perform paving, I mean pavement markings on various Douglas County roads and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending the final legal review. Director Peacock again. Yes, ma'am. This is the uh, 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 
award of contracts for the county roads where the county does the paving, mm -hmm. this company, these companies would come behind us and actually put the striping down, the paint on the asphalt to show lanes and you know crosswalks and things like that. Uh, we did this out, the due date was um, the 14th of June. We had three companies provide us unit pricing um, and our desire is, as we've done in, I think, prior contracts, no, that's not right, this is the first time we would have done it this way, we're asking that the county allow us, or the commission allow us to award the contracts to all three and then we'd be able to go look at the unit pricing and there's probably 30 or so different categories of unit pricing and then we could go to those and look to see which would be the, uh, the most competitive for us um, to use. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners, Vice Chairman Robinson? Yeah, just real quick, just for, for to clarity. So um, this would also, so in-house, and, and Director Valentin could probably answer, in-house, um, um, Hilton Garden Inns, Walmart, um, Interstate, North Parkway, West, um, both sides of that U, uh, we did that in-house, and so therefore this group would go back and do the, the, the permanent striping. I just want to confirm what I'm listening to. That is correct. It, it would be not just uh, uh, roads that we do in-house, but it could be roads that we didn't do anything because they were in good condition, but the pavement markings need to be refreshed. So it would be on those roads as well. Okay. All right. Are you? Okay. Thank you. All right, then. We'll move on to the next item. And last but not least is tab number 14, approval of the surplus items report from the period from January 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. Director Peacox again. Yes, ma'am. Um, on a quarterly or semi-annual basis, we bring to the board a listing of all of the um, items that have been surplus by the county departments. Uh, we present that to the uh, county administrator for his uh, sign off on the list. Most of the things that have been surplused in this past year have been uh, outdated computer equipment and different um, uh, junk, if you will, that the IS department has asked to be, uh, to be uh, gotten rid of. Okay, any questions from the board? Uh, Commissioner Snyder. Bill, this is part of the refresh surplus, uh, right? Because we refresh our computers uh, every uh, on a cycle of five years, I think. It's a continuing program that and we so give them money each year. And so these are the ones we surplus as a result of replacing. It could be some of those. What happens is, down in IS, they will um, <coughs> salvage parts, <laughs> parts, of it. parts from those that And they remove the hard drive. They remove the hard drives. It's basically just... All, there's nothing left but uh, just piece parts of okay. the machine once they get through with it. All right. All right. We're going to All right. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah. Just related to that, and again, when you think about assets, um, small assets, departments think they don't need, but obviously we need to do proper disposal of them, um, transition them to the, the next state of whatever they're going to be. But also, I, I guess, related to that, um, um, when we have passive assets or un unused assets such as land um, that we just got sit from the books. Um, everything has value, um, no different than um, these objects here, which may be, you know, it, it just may be whatever it is to get rid of them. But um, now I'm sure related to that, and, and it, not to extend this, but um, have we ever did an assessment of our current, um, all our assets? Not just small things the departments do. You guys do a great job. That's, that's, that, that's, but it, it opens up the bigger picture, which is all the other assets that the county has that may just be sitting there that, like, okay, why do we got these on the books? What are we doing with this? Could there be other value? Can it create other revenue? I'm just curious, have we, we gone through that um, recently? Um, um, not to my knowledge, but. Not uh, purchasing. Yeah, I mean, we purchasing. would not value land and buildings and things like that. So. But it's something that we do consider. <coughs> I just think we have know. reviewed the land at one time, is that correct, Mark? Yeah, I think because so. Some yeah, of, a lot of it was in flood zones. This was reviewed 
yearly for insurance purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We never talked about it as a group. It's just something that, at your pleasure, I think yeah, we probably could look at it at some point. I would love to look at it. That's something we can do compile information. <coughs> Our work with finance, I guess that would be one start and then purchasing still can't admit that. Yeah, it. so we just have to pull the task force together and look at it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, that completes all our uh, business items today. However, just please, clerk, if you could just make a note, number eight, uh, we will be delaying that until hopefully two weeks because we definitely want to press to prevent our streets from being paved and all those intersections that we want to look at. And then number 11, <coughs> the of the merit changes, that's something we just discussed kind of earlier today. So we won't uh, expect to see that on the agenda tomorrow. All right, we have presentations. We have one presentation today, and I did this on purpose only to lay out uh, presentations to the end to allow our other directors to get back to work if they needed to get back to work. Presentation is the Federal Opportunity Zones, and our Director of External Affairs, Tiffany Stewart Stanley, has, uh, she will kick off, and I believe she has a representative here today to, to talk about these federal yeah. as a whole Many. team. No way. Thank you for having us today. Um, I, I, <coughs> she's going to kick off and then she'll bring you up so she can introduce you. Okay. That's part of our record. Thank you for being here. Thank you. commissioners and the board staff members. So Tiffany Stewart Stanley, Director of External Affairs. I think as most of we know, as most of us know, Douglas County is one of six counties in the metro Atlanta area that has a federal qualified opportunity zone. And that area, I have it pulled up here on this map, um, is comprised of District 1 and District 2. And you'll see here it kind of runs from Old Douglasville Road down south to Fairburn Road and from North Burnt Hickory over to Leroy. Uh, Commissioner Robinson and State Representative William Bodie, they've been working hard to make sure that the citizens of Douglas County know this information and just, you know, we, he wanted to have a presentation today so that we can get that information out. So today we have representatives from the Department of Community Affairs. We have our regional representative, Mr. John Van Brunt here, and um, a program manager, Ms. Holly Hunt, and she's going to give us a great presentation today on federal qualified opportunity zones. So I'll try to go over Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hunt. It's Holly Hunt, right? Holly Hunt. Oh, Holly yes. Hunt. Thank, Thank you very much. Hunt. Thank you. And I do appreciate y'all asking us uh, to be here today. Um, so I, I did look at your opportunity zone before I got here. And you can you can drill down into those um, and look. And I noticed a lot of it was undeveloped, and I couldn't tell by the to topography why that was. Is it is it just not is it just undeveloped, or is it is there a reason why, or just kind of give me a lay of the land of that? A lot of it's over this year, like we have Camargo Park and then. Just, just, just park, park area, yes. or just forest, that, maybe. Yes, there's and it's north of the county. Not a lot of forest, but yes. Okay, okay. Um, and just so I know, have y'all started working on federal opportunity zones, or talking about it, or anything at this point? My PowerPoint is very basic. Is, is, I, is I think asking. that was the premise of just we, we needed a primer or primer. Okay. To understand okay, what we're right. looking at. So that's why we're pausing, looking at you, hoping you could give us more insight. Okay. So, very so, good. So that's what I'm here to do. Yes. We're, yes. Okay. We're good. So you're good. So, yeah. so the first part of the presentation Sorry. is just the basics. Okay. The first eight slides is just the basics of fair opportunity zones. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the last part of the slide is what we talk about communities on what to do, okay? What to do to um, create a plan, if you will, and how to attract investors once you develop your plan. Okay, so that's kind of how it breaks down. So I just didn't want to make sure that I was 
um, that y'all were so advanced and that my be the, be that the beginning was going to be, you know, talking to the experts. Okay. You're right on point. You're right. All right. So, very good. So, let's get started. So, the role of DCA so far is, and it's just facilitator, educator, and repository of information. So, we don't opine on the statutes <coughs> or the rules or anything. Um, so I'm just here to give you basic information of what it is. So don't get discouraged or disappointed if I can't answer a lot of questions on the actual statutes or rules. Um, we refer to the tax accountants and the attorneys for that, and I do have a list um, if, you, if you so would like to have that list of who I refer people to and who I call when I have a question. Um, so a lot of people do call me with questions, and sometimes I'll, I'll just call my, my list of experts to try to get answers or I'll refer them. So I'll be glad to share that list with you. Um, so basically, what are, what are opportunity zones? They're low-income community, uh, community census tracts. They were designated for investments. 25% of, of the state's low-income community census tracts are eligible for designation, okay? Only 25%. So, Governor Deal approved 260 uh, community census, uh, census tracts that were approved by Treasury in 2018. Um, designations are good for 10 years. And the question I get most almost every day is can I move it? Can I move a boundary? No. The census tracts are designated as is for 10 years. You, you wouldn't believe how many calls I get. If I have a, if, you know, I have a census tract, I have an FOZ on this side of the road, but my project's on the other side of the road, can I move that boundary just a little bit? No, we can't do that. And um, something that's just recently come up, come up is there was one county that was gonna move the boundaries of their census tracts. They're actually changing their census tracts? No. The actual boundary of the current census tract stays. So if the census tract starts moving around, you got to keep up with the original property line boundary of the original census tract. So that's really starting to get screwy for some people. Okay? So just remember, you can't move them, can't swap them. They are what they are for 10 years. Um, so they're created by the Tax Jobs, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017. Um, the purpose is to connect investors to overlook the credit worthy opportunities. There's tax benefits to this, okay? Um, by, by temporary deferral on capital gains, reduction of capital gains liability, tax exempt on gains um, of opportunity fund. The best thing is there's no cap on benefits, okay, for the investors. So let's talk about that. Uh, they can reinvest unlimited amounts of capital gains into an opportunity fund within 180 days. So in year one, the capital gain is invested. In year five, if they, they keep it in there for five years, all right, there's a 10% step up in basis, which means there's a 10% reduction of the original gain. And I'm gonna go through an example in a minute. Year seven, Okay, is when the taxes are due, and there's a 5% additional step up in basis point, so there's a 15% reduction of original gain. And then, like I said, in your seven, that's when the taxes are due. Ah! That's a touch screen that makes it move, isn't it? <laughs> Y'all are too fancy for me. Oh no, I, I don't know where I am. Sorry. <laughs> There you are. <laughs> I'm so used to touching the screen. I got to remember to keep my hands to myself. I can't, can't, I'm a talker with my hands, I'm sorry. Uh, and then in year 10, all right, that, this right here deals with the capital gains. In year 10, this deals with the earnings that you, that you make while your money is in the opportunity fund. There is no tax on what you earn 
why your money is in the investment. Okay? So that's what all the hullabaloo is about for the investors. So let's look at a let's look at a so in 2019, say that you have a million dollars in capital gains you want to defer. So you're going to invest that million dollars in a federal opportunity zone. In year 2026, you're going to keep it for seven years. <clears throat> I missed the five-year plan. I missed the five-year when I typed this, didn't I? Sure, certainly did. Say in five years that you keep this, you want to get out of it you would pay taxes only on 90, 900,000, okay, because you get 10, 10%. In mm -hmm. year seven, your taxes are due and you're gonna get out of it. At that point in time, you would only, you would only pay taxes on 850,000 because you have the 15%, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so let's go, say that you're gonna keep it in there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the seven year mark, you pay, I didn't even touch it. <laughs> At the seven year mark, you're going to pay taxes on the 850000 And then in year 10, so you've taken care of your capital gains here. In year 10, you've kept it in there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now you owe nothing on what you earned while your money was in the fund. You owe nothing on what you earned for that 10 years that your money was in the fund. But pretty good return. So that's the incentive, mm -hmm. the tax incentive given to those that are investing in the opportunity funds. Okay? So what are opportunity funds? Okay, so those are the investment vehicles. They're organized as corporations or partnerships. It has to be a corporation or partnership. They're very flexible. They can be self-certified. Say that you're a developer and you want to form your own, you want to be your own opportunity fund. You have your own capital gains. You want to form a partnership or a corporation. You can self-certify self as an opportunity fund invest your own monies into a project, manage it yourself, and take advantage of, of this program. Or there are many, many opportunity funds out there, okay, that you can simply put your money into that opportunity fund and the opportunity fund does the investments for you and manages everything for you. So opportunity funds can be closely held, or they can be managed funds. Don't don't leave that point when um, you say partnership. Um, you're not talking about this is strictly for private sector involvement. There's no public private partnership. There's no leverage of uh, perhaps even though we wouldn't benefit from all that you're referring to gain. We're not allowed to to, to leverage the bigger picture um, through a you know a, a broad need in the community. They they can leverage they can leverage the federal opportunities and investments with with anything. Okay. But it can be part of a capital stack, okay. if you will. Okay. That's the word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm good. It can be Thank part you. of a stack, capital stack. Yep. Commission. Uh, I've heard uh, Dr. Ben Carson talk about opportunity zones for yes. housing. Yes. So you're saying like an investor can come in and buy maybe some rundown apartments, fix them up. A workforce okay. housing, affordable housing, that's that's really where a lot of this money is going. Okay. So uh, what he's talking about are the same things that you're talking about. Yes, ma'am. It's just on housing. Yes. All right. a, a lot of this is going for housing, and there are um, there is a housing uh, capital firm here in Atlanta that does strictly housing for, with federal opportunity zones. But the... This right here, is this little blue thing, is that our opportunity mm -hmm. design? That's the only one we have? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually what about the one on Highway uh, Thornton Road that we approved a few years back? <coughs> that is a state, state opportunity design. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, you got a federal and you got a state. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, so they, the, they get off of their state taxes. Yes, ma'am. And this one gets off their federal, what their capital gains. This is this di totally different. <coughs> okay. Good to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. And they, the opportunity funds make sure that 90% of the assets are in a qualified opportunity zone property. Okay, so 90% of the funds have to be invested in a qualified opportunities in zone property at all times. Mm -hmm. So they manage that for you if you're not a self-certified opportunity zone. So let's talk about that. So there's three types of eligible investments for opportunity funds. Okay, they can either invest in stock, purchase stock of a company. Okay. They can purchase a partnership interest or purchase part of a business property. So those are the only three ways that, in, that an investor can invest in, a, in an opportunity zone project. Stock, partnership interest, property. And y'all, while I leave, there's also this webinar on our website. We partnered with George Municipal, uh, GMA and GCF, and there's a, a web, the same webinar. It's just on GMA's website, and GMA's uh, kind of changed up the slides to fit their, what they wanted it to look like, what I don't have the capability of doing, I tried. <laughs> I had to put this on our slides, and I'm not that uh, coordinated, but theirs is prettier, to be honest with you. Um, but just in case you forget, uh, this, this same presentation is on the, our website and DMA's website. So those are the three ways uh, to invest. So, could so the, that's the basics. <clears throat> could the city have opportunities? That one is not on this map. The city no, those, that, those, are, those are the opportunity zones. Okay. And we, that was our interactive map to use, was it not? Um, DCA has a really nice website, and on that website is our interactive map, which is what Tiffany used, and then um, once you determine where your projects are going to be and what it is you want to attract to Douglas School, there is a, there is a section on there where you could submit a development opportunity and you go on that website and you put all the information out there and, and upload a picture and then it will appear on our map. And, it, and then, see, and then it tells the investors and the opportunity funds, hey, here's a project in Douglas where you need to look at. But it has to be in there. So it's an interactive map out there. So as soon as you, as soon as you know what you want to do, get it on the map. Okay, because we're starting to, we're, uh, as soon as we get some more projects out there, we're going to be doing a press release to let all the developers and, and opportunity funds know. And we are also going to list, uh, do links to some opportunity funds. Nova Braddock has a very good list of opportunity funds and the National Council of Housing, I think it's NCSHA website, NCSHA has a wonderful list of opportunity funds. You'll see them listed um, in alphabetical order, I believe, and then they'll say what states they're interested in. There's a lot that are interested in Georgia. And then it'll tell what type of investments, whether it be housing, business, everything, mixed use, retail, um, that you can you know, call yourselves once you, <coughs> once you determine what it is that you, that you want. Are these done each year? Uh, this is uh, says that he approved it in 2018. Will there be another? Uh, there hasn't been any talk yet of more f of uh, another piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, these are designated for 10 years, so this is expected to to keep going for at least that. Okay. Um, yeah. So that was the basics. Now we, now we talk about what a community needs to do when they're talking about what, what they want to 
plan for their federal opportunity zones. Yes, ma'am. Holly, I'm just looking at some of your data that you provided for the social economic overview, and I'm just looking at a couple of numbers that I feel that are skewed, like, and it certainly may be something that could be adjusted. If you look at your unemployment in 2018 in Douglas County, I know you have one that is specifically to opportunity zones, and the next one is for Douglas County. It says Douglas County's uh, unemployment rate is 4.9. It's really 3.4 percent. So I'm not sure if that's something that could be adjusted. And that, then, Chairman, that information um, has come from a regional snapshot from the Atlanta Regional Commission. They did a regional snapshot on, on, the, on the six counties, and they kind of provide that information. So I provided that to the commissioners just so you can have some background information on what the status was of the opportunity zones versus that of Douglas County. So we can, I can reach out to ARC and make sure they have the correct information. Then on that median household income is not 59, it's 65. Mm -hmm. For Douglas, mm -hmm. you can adjust it. Okay, thanks, that's all I have. So what we're, what we're telling camp, uh, communities is focus, plan, and collaborate, okay? On our website, we have a link to the Atlanta Prospectus. How many of you have seen the Atlanta Prospectus? It's a great resource. Mm -hmm. If you'll take a look at the Atlanta Prospectus, okay. and the Make and Bid Prospectus is also out there. Mm -hmm. There's On our website, there's also a blank, there's, there's a community template that you can use to walk through for yourself. It's all the same because everybody used the same template that Bruce Katz came up with. He's a big name in the world of federal opportunity zones. So every city across the United States is using <coughs> Bruce Katz's community uh, template. But um, it kind of helps you tell the story of Douglasville, Douglas County, because you want you don't want to look at just one little piece. You want you want to tell the investors what does Douglasville, Douglas County have to offer. And when you're looking at that, you're also trying to look regionally. Think tourism. Think when you when you're trying to attract somebody in for um, whatever housing, mixed use, business. What are the amenities here for people that would come even within an hour or two hour drive. So think outside the box as well. Okay? So pull your pull your community leaders together. City, county, EDA, whoever you can think of that are your community leaders and bring them together for all of this. Especially your collaborating. And when you look at the community's prospectuses that I just mentioned, Atlanta and Megan Bibb. <laughs> That's why we were laughing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I need to just stay away from the board. Am I going the wrong way? Here you go. Don't focus so much on the glossy print that they've got. Think more on the content right now. Okay, because if you think more on the content as you're putting all this together, then the glossy print will fall into place eventually. All right, that's the end, very end result. Okay, think more on the content. I'm <laughs> staying away from more. So you want to focus on what your community needs, and then you got to think about your developer and your investor. Okay, that's the pieces that all, are all going to come together. What does your community need? And then think about your development and investment. So what does your community need? What's your vision for your community? Look, think about all these things. Do you need more commercial? Do you need light industrial? Do you need more manufacturing in those in those opportunity zones? Think of, think of the lay of the land. Think of where it is. What you're trying to attract. Do you need multifamily development, single family housing, mixed use development, affordable or work workforce housing? Do you need a community center? 
charter schools, grocery stores? Do you have any food deserts out that way? Do you need office buildings, parking structures? Do you need infrastructure? And we'll talk about infrastructure in a minute. And then think about what can be accomplished and how do you engage the developers? Okay? So let's talk about the developers. What are their concerns? Returns, because they're going to want returns. Readiness to proceed. We can make it started. If they start now, will they be finished in time for the investment prior to 12 31 19? Time's closing in because, in order for them to take advantage, full advantage of that 10, that 10 year plan and that seven years, 15% on their money, they got to invest by the end of this year to take full advantage of that seven year. They got to invest by the end of the year. Oh, it's Clearly. not a rolling 10 years from when you start. It's already started. Well, now the, the 10 years can be rolling. Okay. But the eight, but the 15% has to be before the end of the year. Already. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because taxes are due on 2026 for the initial the investment. So and if they want their 15 year, if they want to cut on that 15 year percent off, then they got to invest by 12, 31, 19. That's a, why this push has been so great. And we were thinking, that, that we were hoping that since the rules that come out till so late, I mean the second set of rules that come out till April, and they still haven't come out with the third set of rules that they're expecting. We were hoping they were going to push that back, but we're not seeing any indication out of Washington that they're going to do that. So, so we get the break now. You've you got to be ready now and put your money in and have liquidity. So the question becomes, I got my money in. Um, I heard you say it can be in an opportunity fund or it can be in already into an investment. So in other words, do I get reap the benefits? Like in other words, we ain't figured it out yet, but if I put it in a fund, do I still get the benefits? The we fund has it? to invest it within 180 days. Within 180. All right, so I get I get a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just following up. You're fine. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any environmental concerns? Is there any? You know, what's the market opportunity? Is it if you're looking for affordable housing and you're surrounded by affordable housing, then there's probably not a lot of market opportunity. But if you're looking at affordable housing and there's no other affordable housing around, yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, and, and anything else, and then you want to talk. Then you want to think about how can you engage the investors. So let's talk about that. So there's two types of investors. You've got your impact investors. You've got your non-impact investors. The impact investors. Are, in, are investors that care about your community. They care about what's going on in your community. They care about a lot of things. So they're not looking for as much. Your non-impact investors, they don't care. They could be from California, they could be from New York. All they care about is returns. So what are they looking for? Returns, returns, returns. That's all they care about is the money, okay? And those are going to be the people on that NCSHA list that are from Timbuktu that are willing to invest in Georgia and they don't care about the environment or the community. They just want their money. So impact investors, yeah, they care about returns, but they also care about community benefits. They might be environmentalists. They might care about cultural benefits, they may, they may care about the arts and the history, so they might really be drawn to something that's, um, you know, uh, mixed use, that's going to have a lot of art uh, mixed in, um, maybe a lot of art galleries and re mixed retail, you know, pe people like that. Um, Philanthropies and, stuff, and such, such like that, uh, philanthropist kind, kind of people that um, just care about the community. 
and they're not going to want as much return as they are to see their community be better, if you will. So those are the two types of investors you're talking about. So one is pure economic and one is maybe a social economic yes. in how they see the world. Exactly. So that's those that, that's what you gotta think about when when you're when you're thinking about what does your community need mm -hmm. and how how do you need to you know who do you need to attract. So here's some resources we have on our website. Um, here's our website. You would go to the Community and Economic Development tab, and then go to, that's supposed to say incentive, not inventive. <laughs> I knew I should have gotten somebody else to prove me. <laughs> oh, well, we're all, also very inventive. Um, then you go to Federal Opportunity Zones. And under that, we have our interactive map that we talked about, you, the Submitted Development Opportunity, um, is the interactive software for communities that I told you about. Once you get your project, you would go there uh, to submit it. The webinar um, that we talked about is out there. Uh, under presentations, you have the community template that you can find. Um, under the resource tab, we have the Atlanta Prospectus and the Make and Bid Prospectus. And I also wanted to draw your attention to uh, the Economic Innovation Group, EIG. They are an excellent resource for finding information on federal opportunity zones. They help write the legislation. They do an excellent job on updating the rules, um, talking about uh, the rules, talking about what's going on in the world of federal opportunity zone, very updated information, if you will. Very shortly, we will have um, the links actually to the opportunity funds that we talked about. It just takes a while for us to get that stuff uploaded. It goes through a process at, at BCA. So that's pretty much um, what we have. This is my information. Um, this is my direct email. It's hollyhunt at bca.ga.gov. If you send it to federal OZ, that goes to more than one person. It goes to me and another person. If I'm not there, she will get it. She is our policy analyst, um, so uh, I travel a good bit doing, I have three programs, and so I do travel the state a good bit, and so if I'm not there in the office, Alyssa can get it and um, help field questions. Are there any questions? Any questions from the board? We asked them along the way, any additional questions or comments? Nice yeah, and more, more of a close out, and, and I appreciate you taking the time. This is something, as um, our uh, director of Stern Affairs mentioned, that we've been waiting on probably for about three or four months, so you just don't know. We're, we're, we're. So here we are in August, and I heard you say 12 31 19. Uh, we got to go. And so the question is, uh, and, and it's more of a just, and it's more for us. I'm talking out loud for our team. It's more for us as, okay, this is August, August, September, October, November. We got five months uh, to reach to, to, to your point to optimize the moment, right? And I heard that right. Uh, optimize. Here's my question: Does the and so this is I got it, I got my marching words on that. Does the new census that's coming out would that have any bearing on this with census track shifts or anything like that, or is it? I'm just asking because we may be asked that. If you shift the census track, just remember that the original boundary is what was designated. Oh, I see. So come up with a come up with a way to to track it. I see. Um, but but don't don't fret over that. Don't don't fret on the twelve thirty one nineteen. Don't let that push you or stress you, because people will still be mm -hmm. investing in this. Because remember, they still get the ten year on their investment, right? That's huge. You, yeah. And you you know you still get to hold it, you know, five years and get your you yeah, know and get your. 10%. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I wouldn't let that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that just stress you to the point where, oh my God, we got to get this done in five months and we got to find our investors in five months. Well, it, it, but back to your point about being shovel ready. This program keeps going. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Are you? <coughs> okay. All right. If Thank you have any questions, just give me a call. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank and you, Madison. Yeah, Thank you for coming so out. And, and, and let me just right. say that. If federal opportunity zones don't work, if if all the you got to know who the property owners are, yeah. 
And if all the property owners in your federal opportunity zones, um, <coughs> if it's all privately held property, and they're not willing to, to sell, and they don't want to develop, then maybe federal opportunity zones isn't your answer. Maybe something else is your answer. Maybe something in John's toolbox is your answer. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to come back and talk about. John, if you uh, could just go to the mic, just introduce. Uh, well, give us your name first. That's John right. Van Brunt, Department of Community Affairs. I would like to come back in about either, let's say, later on September or maybe October and discuss some of the other programs that we have. We mentioned Opportunity Zones, uh, State Opportunity Zones. That's a thirty-five hundred dollar job tax credit for every job that's created within that zone um, for five to ten years. So there's just so many. We have over 50 different programs that we can assist and that we do assist weekly uh, here in Douglas County. I work closely with Chris, Breezy, Jonathan, and Michelle on a weekly basis. Your develop, thar, development, uh, development authority is strong, it's lean, and they know what they're doing and they work hard. So, but I would love to come back and just discuss some of those, some more of those programs that could be additional tools in the chest. Okay. Yes. We definitely will have you back. Tiffany, if you could just make an arrangement for you to come back, I'd greatly appreciate it. Commissioner uh, Guy has a question just for you, John. Just one question. Uh, is there any minimum amount of property that can qualify? With the Fair Opportunity Zones? Uh -huh. So, I mean, uh, Drew, there is no minimum. Uh, the ideal scenario, I always say, because this is our first one, this is our first Federal Opportunity Zone. Uh, meeting that we went out and actually to a, a smaller group. Usually we do uh, little conventions or something where we're trying to get the region or they want like three in Atlanta, one in Statesboro, one in Albany. So this is the first time we were able to come out and we kind of didn't know, expect what kind of questions y'all were going to ask or what we need to say. But I feel the ideal scenario that I've heard at several different events is say a company is in Mississippi, has an old mill, and they want to dump that mill. They can sell that mill and not have to pay that capital tax and inject it into one of these zones and not have to pay the capital gains for 10 years. Is that, is that accurate or no? Say that again. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but basically I was saying that uh, a company has an old mill or an investment that they want to basically offload and they want to get that, instead of having to pay those capital gains, they can take that um, gain and inject it into one of these federal opportunity zones mm -hmm. to help spur development mm -hmm. on a fund, correct? Mm -hmm. Or no? I don't know that I truly understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So maybe I, I get it. I got to work I through get, that. I get I'm, still, I'm still developing a thought. But <coughs> the idea is just basically this is one tool in the it's chest. Like a tax shelter. Yeah, it's, it's a tool in the chest mm -hmm. that uh, will just incentivize outside investment and that's what we're trying to do and that's what the federal government is trying to do with these and we have other uh, programs that we can layer with those to make it more attractive and you y'all utilize a fair amount of them so but thank you and I look forward to coming back and seeing y'all well, thank you so much thank you we look forward to seeing you very soon all right board commissioners that was our presentation today and we really appreciate the department of community affairs for coming out rendering such a great presentation something that we've been waiting on for a while but not too long but we did it's certainly we we're still in our infant stage and we're we're progressing as as you uh, spoke today so thank you so much and we look forward to some uh, more conversation at this time board commissioners we have anything to what call uh, for, uh, talk to our uh, attorney about our executive session. Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? Yes, ma'am, uh, for personnel and legal. Okay, thank you so much. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. All right, take a 10 minute break and I'll see you all here. We are at the noon day hour. We made our cutoff. Noon day was my car. This meeting, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, any other questions or concerns from yes. the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have something. You want to yeah, this, this is the miscellaneous items, but I'm going to call it what's called previous question. Go back to something else that happened earlier in our meeting. Um, uh, Jennifer King is here, um, and this is we're just uh, picking back up on. We have a copy of this link resource guide, which is um, I, I, you you call it a resource guide. I knew it was linked some kind of way. But here's my question. Um, 
um, and I want to confirm openly that this document, um, uh, which provides, um, why don't you just tell us what's in it for the record? <laughs> How about that? Um, this document was uh, created to list out all local resources, um, even stretching into probably Atlanta area. And it is separated by what service you're looking for. Yep. Um, whether that's substance abuse, mental health, housing, aut autism, everything. It's separated out with their contact information. If they provided us with their payment insurance and all that information, it's in here too. So this is an exhaustive resource guide. Um, it looks yes. like, I mean, uh, it, this is something that's very important. Um, uh, and, and so this was produced separate from our core group. Is that accurate? I'm just trying to find yes. who gets credit for such a one. What I Jill see. Hopson. <laughs> Jill Hopson. Okay. Can't tell you how much she works on this. It's, it's a task. Okay. Jennifer Moore here? I'm here. Yeah. All right, Jennifer Moore. Just make a note of this. This is related. As part of our core grant, uh, which the Board of Commissioners have always been so gracefully um, helped us over the past three years uh, award, um, that $50,000 was, um, was given to core to facilitate certain services, uh, meaning uh, it was given to core and they gave subcontracts to people out in what we want to call boots in the, in the street, boots in the field. All right. That being said, as part of that though, some of that money, uh, that $50,000, was um, kept back to produce certain documents. One of the things that was said is that there was a resource guide that was produced as part of the follow-up, not this year's accounting, but last year's. My question is, what happened to the money? If you produced it, and you produced this, and yet there was an accounting, I, I, I just sometimes I just try to follow like living. If you did it, and we were told that, so I'm going back to, um, uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. You guys hear exactly what I want to find out. So, um, Madam Chair, if you please, I'd like to get with um, our finance director and Jennifer Moore, Jennifer and Jennifer. And maybe go, I want to clarify mm -hmm. what I know to be uh, what I just heard, which is a contradictory fact of what was reported times past. Okay. And that, take it offline. We'll take it offline. Cool. That's okay. all I needed. <laughs> Thank you. You're good, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. You're back with now. Be, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma has something. Yeah, Thank you. So, am I to understand that this is produced each year, each calendar year by your department? It is. This this time of year, like about the middle of summer, Jill reaches out to everybody to get the information back. And she compiles this, and then we send off to printing. Um, I don't even know how many copies. And then we also, she saves it as a PDF that we can send out to people through email. Um, do you know how long you all have done this, just by your recollection? Oh my goodness. That's too long. Several years. No. I, mean, I, I, Several can years. I can find out from her exactly how long, but probably at least, at least five. Yeah. Okay. And I, it would be wonderful if we could get a PDF of this. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And yes. she's, yeah, she's in the process of updating the new one, but it probably won't change a whole lot. Got it. Yes. Thank you so much. I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Commissioner Guyton. Yes, um, I know this is Celebrate Recovery here, and there's four of them. And you've only got one number. So you might well, want to. need them. <laughs> you might need to yes. ask what church they're at or wherever. Yes. Um, because there are four of them, and people like to go to the mm -hmm. one that is in their area. Mm -hmm. We also, um, in our waiting room area, we have an array of brochures and things too um, that we use. So anytime somebody brings us something. Can I bring you Yes, please. Some, yeah. please. <laughs> please. Okay, and I think Grief Share too. Or a lot of churches have Grief yeah, Share. And you might want to check with some churches to see if they've got a class. Okay. Thank you. Good time. Okay. Anything else come before this board? There's nothing else to come before us. This meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.